Every day, billions of us make choices about what to eat. These choices feel small and personal and relatively insignificant. Getting your morning coffee and a pastry from the cafe at the bottom of your building, grabbing a sandwich for lunch, or reheating leftovers for dinner are easy examples of these choices. These choices are based on what we want and how much of our time and resources will be required. We choose our meals based on what we feel like eating or whatever gluten-free, vegan, paleo thing our diets require. Suffice it to say that here in the developed world, we are very used to getting what we want to eat when we want to eat it. Now, on the surface, this system appears to be working well. But what are the impacts of those choices? When we start this investigation, a whole other truth emerges. We're making seemingly small, benign choices, but the accumulation of those choices is actually wreaking havoc on our individual lives and on the life of the planet. Here's what I'm talking about. At the local level, we have the home is no longer a child's primary source of nutrition. We have three generations of family members who no longer know how to cook. In the US, one in three meals is eaten in a car, and many people in this city cannot afford to feed themselves and their families. Now, when we think about this at the global level, the impact grows. We have greenhouse gas emissions contributing to climate change from transporting food all across the planet. We have monoculture crops, which are destroying farmland and rainforest. Farmers continue to struggle to make a living by growing our food. And there's an increase in diet-related illness on both sides of the spectrum. What this list teaches us is that our current model is not working. What brought us to this time and place in history is not what is going to take us into the future. We need some new ideas to chart a fresh trajectory forward. There is another possibility here for us, friends. There is a world where we return food to a place of priority and invest in it. I am here today to tell you that your life can be transformed by the way you eat. Let's think about the original purpose of food. Whether you take a scientific, spiritual, or indifferent approach to creation, it is fair to say that food was about survival. We ate food to stay alive and to have the energy to work and move. Civilizations around the world have been built around access to food, and in many cases, language emerged around a cook fire. A farmer friend of mine once told me that food is the way in which we receive nutrients from the earth. This completely blew my mind, as I had never even considered this relationship before. I had never understood that the earth contained nutrients that I needed to live, and that the food we grow is the delivery mechanism that enables that relationship. This positions food as so much more than fuel, and eating as so much more than simply filling the tank. Our food is quite literally what tethers us to the earth. I'd like you all to really take a moment and consider this. Think about this idea of using food to get nutrients from the earth. Think about what you eat, who cooks it, and how do you eat it? How tapped into this essential life force do you actually feel? What is it about the way you eat that opens you up or closes you off from this really important connection? And what does that tell you? To me, closing off from the source leaves you missing out on one of the most necessary and joyful elements of being human. In a sense, resisting a true connection with good food is similar to resisting a true connection with your own humanity. Now, I understand that this might sound a little lofty and untethered in reality, so I say you should live however you like. But open your eyes to the nature and the impact of the choices that you are making. Are you really too busy to connect to your basic life force? Okay, so by now you might be wondering why I care about this so much. Uh, the, the reason is quite simple. I love food. I love cooking and feeding people. I love getting people excited about food. And yes, let's be real, these are not the hips of a girl who also does not love to eat. But there's more happening here because my love of food 
transcends indulgence and sense pleasure. I fell in love with the real heart and soul of food. So after I finished university, I made a deal with my parents that I would take a year off to live in an ashram, which is essentially a Hindu monastery in the mountains in India, and that I would figure myself out and come home with a concrete plan for my future career. Uh, so I spent the better part of a year living in this small rural Indian town. I went for walks, I ate mangoes, and I wrestled with what I felt was a burning existential quest. Uh, the aunties who worked in the kitchen in the ashram saw me hanging around, constantly writing in a notebook, seemingly doing nothing. Uh, one day they came up to me and asked me if I knew how to cook, and I had made a few moves in university, but I did not know how to cook Indian food. They recoiled in horror at my response and demanded to know how I was going to find a husband. <laughs> I, at the time, I honestly didn't even know the answer to that, so I played along. They immediately dragged me into the kitchen, and I did their work that night. They sat and inspected my chapati rolling like prospective mothers-in-law. I went back the next day and the day after that, and pretty soon, I fell in love with everything to do with the kitchen. Now, it's important to note that this kitchen was a very different vibe to the kitchens we have here. There was no butcher's block or steel toes or crisp white linens. We worked barefoot in what was considered a sacred space, chopping vegetables in our laps and kneading dough on our haunches. And I loved every minute of it. Now, here's where things got interesting. I started to notice what happened when the, cook was, the head cook was in a bad mood. He'd be snarly, banging things around, and that bad mood would hang over all of us in the kitchen. Then we'd deliver this food out to the community of mostly monks and nuns, and you would watch a wave of indigestion pass across the entire dining hall as everybody got a taste of that bad mood. Now, on the other hand, on the days when his girlfriend would visit, he'd have a little sparkle in his eye and a spring in his step, and we'd be laughing and singing in the kitchen. And I learned that his good mood was just as powerful as that bad mood. And then we'd deliver that out to our guests who ate that up and then took it out with them during their day. To me, this was powerful and impressive. And it was here that I learned about the exponential impact that a cook can have with one pot of food. It was here, friends, in this tiny little remote Indian village that I learned that the job of a cook is a tremendous responsibility. So I came home from India, went to cooking school, and never looked back. Uh, in all of the kitchens I work in, I have a dedicated practice of mindfulness, where I leave my frustrations at the door while I'm washing my hands and tying on my apron. This allows me to be present and offer my best intentions to my guests through my food. I hold food at a high priority. I consider it the very life force that holds an individual and a community together. This perspective uncovers a real opportunity for us to make good, impactful change to the way we interact with food. We need to rethink our values and understand that a good, joyful, happy, sustainable life is not about control of our food, but rather an investment in our food. Instead of measuring and manipulating our food, we need to invest in our food and consider the level of priority that it gets in our lives. How many of our resources do we devote to our food, our time, our money, and our attention? The World Health Organization suggests that on average, people should spend between 18 and 20% of their annual income on food. Currently, in North America, we spend less than 10% of our annual income on food. And with such a low investment, what can we honestly expect as a return? The tremendous Dr. Vandana Shiva taught me that all transformation comes from the joy of the thought of the better state. My friends, we need to reconnect ourselves to this essential life force and envision optimal levels of health and happiness in thriving communities around this planet. Basically, we just need to start taking food more seriously. So how do we do this? I think there are three transitions that we need to make. First, we need to move from an unanimated state to an animated one. 
A lack of access to good food can have a very significant impact on a life and a community. And people have, communities, kitchens, have become disconnected from a good food source for a real variety of reasons. I heard LaDonna Redmond, community organizer, talk about her experience in Chicago like this. I can get a semi-automatic weapon easier than I can get a tomato in my neighborhood. This truth is serious, right? And it's kind of heartbreaking. But what is encouraging is that I know that it works the other way. I know that increasing access to good food can actually bring a person and a community back to life because you are very literally putting the life source back in. I have seen this happen repeatedly in the community food security work that I do and in the hospitals and the schools who I have worked with. The next transition is about our relationship with eating. We need to move it from being transactional to being engaged. The industrial food system has done a wonderful job of reducing our connection with food down to a transaction. Food is something we just simply purchase, produce, uh, prepare, and consume, with no real connection to the hands that move the food from field to kitchen to table. A more sustainable connected model has us focusing on engagement with producers, purveyors, and cooks. Engagement lets you revalue the hands involved in putting good food on the table. The transaction keeps you focused on what you can get. Engagement opens you up to what you can be a part of. When I worked in a hospital, we took one of the kitchen teams out to a farm to where they grew salad greens that we were hoping to serve to patients. After touring the farm, one of the staff, and we learned about this, the painstaking process involved in growing and harvesting these greens. One of the staff members who worked in tray assembly came up and asked me if we were honestly going to be serving this food to patients. When I said yes, the answer, we were definitely going to do this, she beamed and told me that she would feel so proud to serve this food to our patients. The final transition that we need to make is from isolation to connection. I ran community kitchens for many years, and the most impactful element of those programs actually had nothing to do with food at all. Time and time again, participants would tell us that coming out of their isolation and into the community space of the kitchen was what was the most valuable impact of the program for them. Sickness and poverty are two things that can really isolate people from each other and from a good food source. On a more personal level, we eat at our desks, in our cars, in front of screens, and on the way to the things that we're prioritizing over our meals. Add technology into this mix, and you've got a recipe for further disconnection and isolation. Now, rethinking this choice opens us up to many connections with our food, with this land, and with each other. When you choose to shop at a farmer's market or ask questions in a restaurant about where food comes from, you are choosing to close the gap between producer and consumer. And you are positioning yourself among a network of people who grow, harvest, buy, sell, cook, share, and eat food. There is tradition involved here. When you sit down at a table to share a meal with others, you are connecting to one of the most basic elements of being human. There's a historical link to what you're doing. The wonderful Dr. Maya Angelou taught that you need to know that you are in a continuum. And once you understand that, you realize that you are worthwhile. You and I matter, and our choices matter too. What we eat matters, and we must remember that the choices we make here have a ripple effect that can be felt well across the, this planet. Okay, what have we learned? Investing in a good relationship with food allows you to be more firmly rooted in your humanity and nourished by your connection with the earth. It really is that simple. In this relationship, we surrender the need for control of our food and focus instead on investment in our food. We shift our thinking from, from eating as simply filling the tank to taking in all of the nourishment that the earth has to offer us. Okay, I can hear it already. People saying this idea is great, but they just don't have the time or it's just too expensive. I say that's just too easy. This is your food we're talking about here. 
Our desire to have our food not require any effort from us is what keeps the industrial food system running. We continue to want cheap, fast food, and they continue to provide it. But something needs to break this cycle. Something needs to change. What do you want out of your life? Do you want a connection with your essential life force? Are you expecting a reasonable outcome based on the input that you're willing to make into your own well-being? Why have we decided to put food at such a low priority that it doesn't get any of our time? And is there something that you are investing in now that is perhaps not offering a really meaningful or significant return? What is required now is a little bit of action from everybody. And the culmination of those actions can start a revolution. And that is our opportunity to make real impactful change in our bodies, in our homes and communities, and across this planet. Again, make whichever choice you wish, but be fully aware of the impact of what you choose. Now, we have more good news. Let's take a look at the impact on a life with a great relationship with food. First, we have the joy of cooking and eating together. Second, we have youth armed with cooking skills and a pocket full of family recipes. We have farmers earning a good, reliable living from growing our food. We have agricultural land that is renewed by ecological growing and gratitude. And we have thriving communities connected to each other through food. And finally, you all need some marching orders. Here is what you can all do now in your own lives to build your connection with food. One, try not to eat anything that comes in a package for a week. Choose foods that are whole and close to the way they came out of the ground. Two, devote one night a week to cooking yourself a meal. Turn the screens off and focus exclusively on what you're eating. Three, ask questions in grocery stores and restaurants about where foods are sourced. Choose Ontario produce wherever you can. Four, share a meal with someone you've never eaten with before and see how the conversation grows. And five, evaluate your food spending. Do your choices pay the people who produced your food fairly? Above all else, here is what I want you to take away with you. In making food choices, we are making choices about who we are. Every day, you have three opportunities at mealtime to vote with your fork for the kind of relationship you want to have with your food. Ask yourself this, what do your food choices say about you? Thank you.